This is the latest and greatest Apple Silicon MacBook Pro. And this is the infamous SQL Server. And together, they're the dream combo .NET developers thought impossible on Apple Silicon. Why is this such a big deal? Hey, yeah? Your VPS bill. You're gonna tell them, right? I was, I was about to. Okay. So there's no magic here, but there is a trick and I'm gonna show it to you in this video. Apple's ARM-based silicon made some x64 apps obsolete. And despite the gains that vendors made in compatibility over the last couple of years, one critical tool still doesn't work natively, SQL Server. And this is a major headache for .NET developers. Over the last three years of Apple Silicon, I've tried different SQL Server-like experiences on my Macs. Even trying to install the x64 server on Windows for ARM, there are some positive signs of life in the end, it didn't work. Uh, it was a wild goose chase. Save yourself the headache. I've already wasted my time and it's not a journey I'd recommend to any of you. Now I finally got to a solution I can live with. And I know some of you are really anxious to find out what it is. Well, I'll tell you right now. And if you want to see how I do it, stick around. But it's going to be a virtual private server. Now I can hear some of you saying, Alex, why the obsession with SQL Server? Why not just switch to SQL Azure or MySQL or PostgreSQL? How do you say that? PostgreSQL? PostgreSQL SQL Server is not just a database engine. It's scalable, highly available, and it's got a suite of features like integration services, analytics engine. Now, it can be pretty expensive to use SQL Server Enterprise Edition, which is why I use the Developer Edition, which is free. You get all the features of the Enterprise one, but it's the developer version. This is not a sponsored video by Microsoft. This video is sponsored by Ionos. More on that in a second. Installing a full-blown SQL Server package is gonna give you full control, unlike those other services which you just have database access to. Who doesn't love the power of full control? As developers, you've been there, right? Granting admin privileges left and right just to get things working. I see you. I would never do that, of course, myself. Anyway, I'm a developer, not a database administrator. I'll just let somebody else worry about permissions. Don't throw shoes. Also, let's not forget about seamless integration for devs, especially when you're in the Microsoft ecosystem. Maybe you're already using Visual Studio. Having SQL Server in your toolkit just makes everything smoother. So let me show you how to use the virtual private server to get SQL Server set up. You can go to ionos.com to get started, but I'm going to go directly to a Windows VPS because that's what I want. Now you can get a Linux VPS, a Windows VPS, and it can also serve as my deployment for my website. And it can host my development environment too. And I did install Visual Studio on there. I installed a website. I'm going a little bit on a tangent here, but when I installed IAS and put a static web page up there, I got a Google Page Insights score of 100%. So in my book, that's good. You're getting a server. You can do whatever you want with it. I'm just gonna do SQL Server stuff with it. I'm gonna choose a data center. I'm in the United States, but you can choose from a bunch of other ones. The costs are pretty reasonable. Here's a small one with two gigs of RAM, 80 gigabyte SSD and two cores. I'm gonna go for this medium and you can go up to 90 bucks a month with a really large one. Let's click on configure here. And now you can select which Windows Server you want, 2019 or 2022. I'm gonna go with the latest backup and recovery. You can configure that if you want to. I'm not gonna do that. I'm just gonna hit continue here. Choose add-ons. I'm gonna hit continue and you can finally do the checkout. Once you're in there, you go to your servers and here's my VPS. That's what I called it. Very creative, right? There's the IP address. You can address that IP by its address. Um, yeah, I did just say that. So everything is gonna go through that IP, whether you configure a website on your virtual private server or SQL Server. However, because now you're managing your own server, you have to make a few configurations through the firewall to let a few services in and out. Let's go to network here and we're going to go to firewall policies. And you can see that I've added a bunch here already. There's my firewall policy. TCP 80 and 443 are configured. That's for the web server. It's automatic. It's already in there. So it's 3389. That is your remote desktop connection. And I'll show you that in a second. I've also added this one, 8172 for IAS web management. If you're doing publishing directly by right clicking on your Visual Studio project and you're doing web publishing right to IAS, Yes, you can do that. It's not going to be a production kind of move. You don't do that in production, but you can do that in development as a test. So you'd have to open up this port, 8172. Then you have MySQL port. I've opened that up because I was testing out MySQL on there. That's 
306. We don't need that in our case, but these two you will need. SQL Server, which is 1433, and SQL Server Browser 1434. And to add a new port, all you do is just type in a number here and then just press this Add Rule button. And that's it. The firewall takes a few seconds to restart and you're good to go. When you expand the MyVPS node here, you will have to pay attention to the initial password of the administrator because that's the account you're going to use to log in. There is a way to get in here through the console, through the browser. It's right here under Actions, Open Remote Console. It's laggy, it's slow, but you can do some initial configuration there if you need to. What I recommend you do is use a remote desktop. You can do that right from your Mac. So right here, I have Microsoft Remote Desktop. All you got to do is just use that IP address. This is the name of the machine. You can use slash administrator. I've created a new user account, Alex, which is also an administrator. You know how it goes create an account and then it doesn't have enough rights. So you just give it admin rights. And that's what happened here. I'm not a Windows administrator. I just give it all the permissions. Don't throw that shoe. Okay. Another way to get in is using Parallels. And I'm running Parallels here. I'm running Windows 11, which is my client. That's where I do my Windows development work. And this has remote desktop in it. And here we are. This works very, very smoothly. It feels like it's a machine that's sitting on my desk, but it's actually somewhere far away. To get SQL Server working on it, you need to go to Microsoft's SQL Server download page and get SQL Server Developer Edition. That's the one that's gonna be full featured, but yet still free. Now comes the exciting part. Well, for some of you, it's gonna be exciting. It's exciting for me because when I double click on this, it not only starts, it also installs stalls. <laughs> Look at this. Installation is completed successfully. This is beautiful in my eyes. SQL Server is installed, but how do we actually get into it? How do we start managing it? Well, there's something called SSMS. What the heck is SSMS? If you're new to this, you don't know what that is. Well, it's SQL Server Management Studio. It's a tool, a visual tool designed to get into SQL Server and be able to do stuff in it. There's a little button here that says install SSMS. You don't have to click the button. You can install it separately. You can install it on a different machine. Click on the download link in that documentation. And there's the executable for it. Double click on that. Go through the installation and setup is done. It may take a couple minutes. I sped it up. Now, sometimes you're going to need to restart the SQL Server service that's running in the background on Windows. If you're making some kind of configuration change that requires a restart, I'm going to show you two places where you can do that. One is right here in Server Manager. This is one of those interfaces that has been around for a number of years, and it pops up automatically on Windows Server machines. You can also just search for it. Go up to Tools and then Services. This will let you see all the services running on Windows. Scroll down to SQL Server. Here you'll see a bunch of SQL Server related things. SQL Server Browser, SQL Server Agent, and SQL Server. In my case, I have a bunch of them. SQL Server can be installed multiple times. Each time you install it, it creates a new instance. So you can create different instances running on the same machine if you want to. I have MS SQL Server and MS SQL Server 01. Those are two different instances. I'm going to be using only the first one. I installed it twice because I'm doing this demo, but you'll probably only have one of them. You're going to want to make sure that SQL Server Agent is running. It's not running by default. So under status, you'll see it's not running. You can click on it and get it running. Notice I left it at manual, but we're going to switch it to automatic so shortly. I'll show you how to do that. And then SQL Server browser, you want to switch that to automatic and start it up too. Now in Windows, search for SQL Server Configuration Manager. This is another tool that's going to list your SQL Server services and related configurations. You'll see that we have the same services listed here that we saw in services, but just the SQL Server ones. So this is actually easier to use because it's only showing you the related services. You also have the SQL Server agent, which is stopped, but you can restart it and you can set it to automatic. So make sure you set it to automatic and then Start it up. Now this will work right now. If we connect SQL Server Management Studio to go into this machine, it'll work, but only locally. How do we get it to work from a remote machine, which is where I'm developing, where I have Visual Studio, to be allowed to connect to SQL Server here? We've already opened up the firewall ports on the VPS configuration, but that's not the only thing we need to do. Inside SQL Server, we need to tell it that it's gonna have incoming connections. So we're gonna go to SQL Server Network Configuration and then Protocols and under TCP IP, we wanna enable that. And if you make changes, you're gonna need to restart your SQL Server service. I'm saying service too much. Server, service, bah, my tongue is getting tired. Restart SQL Server service because you made a significant configuration change, you need to restart it. 
Now, pop open SQL Server Management Studio, and if you don't put a server name or an IP address in there, you can put a dot, and that's gonna tell SQL Server Management Studio to look at the local machine, the default instance. Notice the authentication type is Windows Authentication. This will work if you're connecting to it from the same machine or from another machine that's on the same domain, but we're not doing that. We're connecting remotely from a completely different machine from my office machine to this virtual private server somewhere where I don't know where it is. So we're going to need to use a different type of authentication called SQL Server Authentication. Notice Windows Authentication works just fine, but SQL Server Authentication is not automatically turned on. Right click on the actual server node here in Management Studio and go to Security. Over here under Server Authentication, Windows Authentication Mode is turned on by default, but you need to enable SQL Server and Windows Authentication Mode, so you can have mixed mode here. And you made a configuration change, so guess what? You get to restart SQL Server service. Let's do that. Now, when you go to Connect in SQL Server Management Studio, your Windows Authentication should work just fine, but if you switch to SQL Server Authentication, it's gonna fail. Why? We just turned it on, didn't we? Yes, but you don't have a SQL Server login associated with your instance. So let's go to security and then logins and you create a new login. And this one is gonna be for SQL Server authentication. I'm gonna call this one Alex, set a password. And because I'm doing development, I'm not gonna enforce the password policy and I'm gonna do a few other things that you're gonna throw shoes at me for. Like give this uh, login sysadmin and all these admin rights. <laughs> Please don't uh, throw shoes. We're gonna enable everything and we're just gonna enable one of the databases to be uh, accessible. That's not gonna be our application database. We're gonna create that one momentarily. All right, you can test to make sure your SQL Server authentication is working by connecting to it from SQL Server Management Studio and boom, there it is. Now here I am in my virtual machine. This is Windows for ARM running Visual Studio 2022 for ARM and I just created a .NET Core app and I have um, Entity Framework in there. Just a single model person. It has an ID, a name and a created at, which is a date. All I need to do is just configure my database connection string, point it to the IP address of my virtual private server, give it a username and password, that's the SQL Server authentication password, not the Windows one. And let's watch the magic happen. We're gonna go down here to Package Manager Console and say update database. This is an entity framework command that's going to take my model and make sure that the database in the destination matches my model locally. So when I hit this command, it's gonna build a project and it's gonna generate the commands necessary in order to create the database and generate all the schema on the database. Now check this out, we're gonna go back here. There's my databases. I'm gonna just do a refresh here and there it is. Test DB, it's got tables in it. Let's take a look at that. I'm gonna select that. Uh, there's no data in there right now. So when I run my app, it gives me an error because I'm trying to get the name of a person. Really bad coding here, folks. This is just a demo. But once we get this working, you'll see that there's nothing stopping you from having a fully fledged application here. So I'm just gonna say people script table as insert new query window. It's gonna generate the SQL for me so I can populate it. Let's give it a name, Bob. And the created time will be um, get date. Run this query. And now when we query the database, you will see that we have one record in there, Bob, and there's the created time. And when we go back and rerun our app, boom, welcome Bob. We have a connection, folks. Now I can seamlessly just go back and forth between my development environment and my database environment just like this. And you wouldn't even be able to tell the difference that it's somewhere else on a VPS. So I like this workflow. It's not the same as having SQL Server installed locally because of all the extra configuration steps you need to do, but hopefully now you know how to do that. So that's how I run full-blown SQL Server when I develop .NET apps on my Mac. If you haven't yet learned about why I run Visual Studio and Windows on my Mac, make sure to watch this video next and I'll see you real soon.